Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalia. I am one of the specialty legal advocates. Um, I work in the legal advocacy department, and I'm a member on the real team. Hi, everyone. My name is Sin. I am a specialty legal advocate from Women's Center and the Shelter Legal Advocacy Department, and I am a member of the real team. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys for introducing yourself. So just a few ground rules um, before we get started. Um, you guys don't have access to be able to unmute your mic, but if you do, for some odd reason, um, please make sure that your mic is completely muted at all times. If you guys have questions, you can use the Q&A box um, and the presenter um, or us as host um, will address the questions as they come or um, some people like to be, uh, address the questions um, at the end. Um, and then also at the end of our webinar, we will be administrating um, a survey. So please, please, please fill out our survey. It will help us give us feedback on how well we did and how we can improve. Um, without, oh, and also we are recording these webinars, just a heads up for everybody. Um, so if you know someone who would like to, be, uh, to attend but couldn't attend, this, um, you can just reach out to us and we will um, be able to provide you with our webinar um, recording. Without further ado, I am going to pass along the mic to our panelists and they will start their presentation. All right, I'm just trying to go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we're going to be talking about um, interpretation services for both civil and criminal proceedings um, and how that's related to our work um, working with intimate partner survivors, violence survivors. So just a quick outline on what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we are going to be talking briefly about uh, the real team, when it was created and why, um, why it was sought out. Um, we'll be doing a brief icebreaker. Uh, we want to have the interpreters, um, you know, we want this to be interactive and engaging. Um, and then Singh and I will briefly be talking about our role um, with court accompaniment and advocacy for our clients. We'll talk about what we've had to do to ad adjust to the changes um, in court due to COVID-19. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about informed communications and then we'll have a closing exercise. So the real team was created in January of 2017. Uh, we received funding in December of 2016 to begin the project. Um, and the purpose of the real team, again, is to provide um, domestic violence outreach, intervention, and support specifically for immigrant, refugee, and um, English language learners. So currently we have seven direct service staff members on our team. We started with four um, and we collectively speak Spanish, Mandarin, Arabic, French, and Nepali. Um, and just a fun fact, I guess, <laughs> we are the only um, service in Allegheny County directly designed to help this population um, of survivors. Thank you, Natalia. So why do we need a real team? So real team clients face many additional barriers. Being able to communicate in English is, does not mean that a person is fully understanding legal terminology. Clients may come from countries or places where women or children had few or no rights. Many types of abuse are not defined as a crime in their culture. Communities and extended family members play a very big role in clients' decision-making. Also, sometimes you will find that clients may be focused on needs that seem relatively unimportant to the attorney who represent them, but are important to the clients. Clients may resist help or assistance from mental health services. And abusers often use immigration related threats to ass assert power and control over their intimate partner. And they might fear that talking to a professional or reporting the abuse 
will get them or their family members deported. And some clients are often unfamiliar with the legal system and the resources are available to them in this country. And the real team is designated to help our uh, clients to go through the civil and criminal justice system in this country and help them to understand and find those resources might be helpful to them. All right, so um, for the group icebreaker, we are going to instead conduct a poll. Um, the questions are here. I think they should be viewable or accessible. Um, something just popped on my screen. So hopefully it popped up on everyone's screen. Um, but we wanna learn a little bit about um, who we have here, what sort of interpreting you do, what languages are um, present here, um, whether you work in court, and if you do, which type of court, um, and then how long you've been interpreting and whether you've had any domestic violence training in the past. So if we could take a few minutes um, and if everyone could fill that out, um, we'll just take a few minutes and then I'll check back in. And if anyone selected other, um, especially for language and uh, which court you work for, if you want to put in the chat the answer, that's fine too. Hey guys, it's okay to have more than one option. Um, you can just select the most prevalent one um, or the one that you do the most of. Um, it doesn't, we know that the poll, you can only do one, um, it's fine. <laughs> All right, um, I think we have most people, I think most people answered. Um, so this is really helpful. Thank you all who participated. I'm gonna end the polling. Okay. Um, and if you didn't get to vote, feel free to just type it in the chat. That's fine too. Um, all right, let me see if I can share these. Oh, did someone share it? 
Okay, I believe they're shared. Okay, so this is helpful. I think we have pretty good representation. It looks like um, we have some court interpreters, some non court interpreters, and about half of you, or a little more than half, haven't attended a domestic violence training in the past. Um, and we have quite a bit of interpreters who have been interpreting for um, less than two years. So we have a pretty diverse group here, I think. All right, well, we use this information. Um, this will be, this will come in handy in our exercise that we are planning to do at the end. So we will move on to court accompaniment. Um, so court accompaniment is something that is very um, prevalent in our role as legal advocates. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were accompanying victims to family court, Pittsburgh Municipal Court and Criminal Court, which are all in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, and occasionally on like a case by case basis, we would do legal accompaniment to other um, places, maybe like magistrates or um, you know child support hearings, things like that. Um, but that's more limited and the bulk of what we do, um, again, pre-pandemic was accompaniment to these three courts listed here. Um, and then since the pandemic, we've had to adjust our workflow. Um, things are constantly changing with the courts, but we've had to adjust our workflow and are still providing services and support to all of our clients. All right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the filing, helping the clients to file protection for abuse order at family court. So first I'm going to cover what it looked like uh, before the pandemic. And then I will talk about what it looked like right now, uh, what we are doing right now filing for PFA um, during the pandemic. So as an interpreter, what to expect when you first arrive? Um, so the PFA unit is located at Family Court in downtown Pittsburgh and on the third floor. So the first thing you arrive, um, make sure you sign in with the clerk in the PFA unit office, and then make sure that they know you are here. And then you will be directed to meet with your client to help your client to fill out the temporary PFA order. And later on, you will direct it to be meeting with the legal advocate together with your client to fill out the temporary PFA order and as well as the um, attorney, free attorney referral application form. Um, so during the temporary PFA, during the time when you are assisting your clients filling out the temporary PFA forms, we recommend that you leave the narrative blank because it's hard, I, we understand it's it takes much longer and it's hard to get the useful information that the judge is looking for and looking uh, during the, uh, among the narrative. So um, we recommend you to just leave that blank and the legal advocate will work on that with you and the client together when you meet together. And as the specialty legal advocates, our role during the Temporary PFA is more a hands-on approach and we offer emotional support. Um, we will do a simple safety plan with the client. And if we see uh, there's a need, um, we always do follow up with our clients and we offer our hotline number to the clients if they need to talk to someone and um, to do a in-depth safety plan. As a legal advocate, we always um, offer some legal options, legal um, like to, to advise the clients their legal rights and uh, some possible outcomes. And we also do referrals um, within our agency as well as outside of our agency. Sorry. And um, then we will help, we will meet with the clients and uh, to talk about, talk through, go through the temporary PFA forms and to write down the narrative uh, for the victim. But this is, this should be written down by the victim 
by the uh, plaintiffs, we are there to help them to uh, organize the narrative. For the final PFA, the specialty legal addict's role is more a backseat approach, which means we will be there to support our clients, and um, but we won't actively interact with the clients and the attorney. We will leave that process to the attorney's hands. And we believe um, we have a wonderful uh, attorneys and they understand our victims, what they have been go through, gone through. And um, if, there's, if we see any, if there's any um, issues or concerns, we definitely will step up and um, talk to the attorney and the clients. And of course, during the process, we, we always support, uh, offer emotional support and a follow up on the safety side. So it's been a while for us to go up to the family court. Uh, it's nice to see this uh, picture. We have uh, documents, we have papers and brochures were translated to, into different languages. And we put out there at the family court PFA unit. So if you are working with a client uh, and you can find any language, any documents that in your language, please feel free to give to the clients um, or you can take some to give to whoever you think um, will need those information. So what it looks like filing PFA during the pandemic. Uh, we all know the, everything changed so fast in the um, past couple months. And now what we are doing is we are um, helping clients filing for PFA remotely. And I'm going to show the, um, an example of the temporary PFA, as well as the attorney referral application. Give me one second, let me pull that up. Okay, so this is a um, the temporary PFA order like application uh, form look like. All the information on this form are fake. So it's, um, we use Jane Doe and John Doe for the example. Um, and we can just go through the um, document and just give you a general idea how it looked like. So this is the cover page. And on the top of the cover page, you will find the hearing, final hearing date here after the client see the judge. And this is the plaintiff's name and defendant's name. On the right corner down here, you can see there are two options. One is temporary PFA petition. One is temporary PFA petition with custody, which means the plaintiff is requesting to address custody issue through the temporary PFA order. On the left corner, you see weapons supplement attached. We are going to talk about that at the end. So the first page is a notice to the plaintiff and the defendant to let both parties know that this is a civil and if the defendant violates the order, then it will become criminal and um, the defendant will face criminal charges and penalties after that. As the defendant, um, the defendant also has the right to hire an attorney to represent um, them at the final PFA hearing. So this is how it looked like for the petition form, the plaintiff's information, and the second part would be the defendant information. Now you see on this specific example, uh, it checked plaintiff's address is confidential. So there's an option for the plaintiff if their address, if they want to choose their address to be confidential. And at the end, there's a attachment to that. So here under the defendant information, you see the address. It says Allegheny County Jail. So this defendant got arrested 
And uh, at the time of the plaintiff filing for the temporary PFA, he, uh, the defendant is in Allegheny County Jail. And so that the sheriff's office know where to serve the defendant. Next will be a place to address because this plaintiff asked the court to address the custody. So the plaintiff is filing for temporary PFA on behalf of um, the plaintiff self and the minor children. So here under custody, yes, check yes, if you want to request it and to address custody. Then it's um, talking about the relationship between the defendant and the plaintiff, any history um, uh, between the two parties in Allegheny County, um, in the civil and the criminal side. And this is a custody supplement. The judge and the court want to make sure that they have basic information about the children and where they have been living, um, who they lived with. This is the custody supplement for the criminal history and abuse history uh, from both parties, which means from the plaintiff's uh, side as well as the defendant's side. So now we are here at the place where you want to write up the, uh, the plaintiff wants to write up, up about the most recent instant of abuse that made the plaintiff to come to file um, temporary PFA that day. The first part is focused on the most recent instant of abuse with the date, time, and a place. And then the second part will be anything that happened prior the, uh, prior uh, to this instant in the past, any abuse happened between both parties and what kind of person the defendant was. And between the two parts, there are police were called. So uh, the legal advocates will ask if the police were called or if the defendant was arrested or if there's an em emergency PFA order issued or if um, medical treatment was assault. So weapon information is another part in the PFA order. Um, so there are uh, places to, for the plaintiff to write if the defendant has used or threatened to use the firearm against the minor children or the plaintiff. And to the best of the plaintiff's knowledge, does the defendant owns or possess those things? And this one is the defendant. So the um, plaintiff can request to fill out a form to request the law enforcement agency to go into the defendant's place and search for a specific firearm and a weapon and relinquish that. So this, um, in this case, the plaintiff requested. So yes. This is how a temporary um, protection from abuse order look like. Uh, again, the plaintiff's information and in children that uh, should be protected under and the defendant's information here. And according to the law in Pennsylvania, um, pending the final hearing, the defendant shall not abuse, harass, stalk, threaten the um, the plaintiff and the protected minor children. And the things listed here. So now we go in go into the custody. So there are a couple, as you see, there are a couple options that you can, the plaintiff can choose. In this case, the plaintiff chose minor children may initiate telephone calls to the defendant, as well as the defendant can is permitted to call. So according to the law, the defendant is not allowed to possess any firearms. If the defendant has any, um, the defendant has to relinquish to the sheriff. And also according to the law, that both parties um, 
has the right to um, go back to the place where they were living to collect their personal belongings with the law enforcement agency um, there. So that's how like it's like a like a simple go through the uh, temporary PFA order and those are the attachments that we talked about. This is the uh, uh, weapon relinquish uh, attachment. And next will be the address confidential uh, form. So this address is only for the court because the court, if the court has to uh, mail you something, mail the uh, plaintiff something, they have to have a uh, address for the court to uh, be able to, uh, to, to mail the things to the plaintiff. Okay. So this is the example for the temporary PFA order. And at the end of the conversation with the legal advocate, um, the legal advocate will offer the opportunity for the client to apply for a free attorney offered by the uh, family court. And women's center and shelter CLP attorneys are, um, are helping out with that project as well. So again, those are just inform basic information about the clients and the defendant and the household member information from the plaintiff's side. And there are questions uh, about the plaintiff's income source as well as the assets. So this just to give you a general idea how it looks like and what you might um, have to like interpret for the legal etiquette for your clients to fill out those forms. Let me go back to the slides. Okay. All right, so preliminary hearings um, at Pittsburgh Municipal Court. Again, this information is uh, pre-pandemic. So um, typically the interpreter would arrive and check in with the legal advocate um, who was signing people in. Um, and the legal advocate will meet with the client first um, and they'll be speaking with each other through the interpreter. At this point, it's just for the advocate to speak with the client regarding any safety concerns. Um, and you know, if they need to provide any crisis intervention or emotional support, that is the time to do it before the uh, victim meets with the district attorney. Um, we'll also go over what to expect from that date and any possible um, court outcomes. Um, after that, the client, the advocate and the interpreter will all meet with the district attorney um, who's on the client's case. Um, so can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, Actually, sorry, I'm just gonna back up real quick. The legal advocate will um, explain to the client like our role. Um, everything that we talk about with the client is completely confidential. Uh, the only exception is that we are mandated reporters. So if there's any indication of child abuse, then we would have to report it to CYF, which is uh, Children, Youth and Family Services. Um, and uh, you can go to the next slide too. Thank you. Um, and we have um, what's called absolute confidentiality, or I'm sorry, that's not, not the right terminology, but essentially um, everything that we talk about is confidential. We have different um, confidentiality. We have a different level of confidentiality than let's say like an attorney and a client. Um, and the only exception to our confidentiality is that we're again, mandated reporters. Um, okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and then, like I said before, we'll also talk to them about possible court outcomes. Um, there's many reasons why, or I'm sorry, there's many uh, possible outcomes. These are just a few that are listed on here. Um, many times we do see cases 
um, you know, that are postponed to a later date, they can be postponed for a variety of reasons. Um, for example, the defendant may want to obtain representation either through the public defender's office or through private counsel. Um, it could also be postponed for the uh, victim to attend court. Um, another possible outcome that we see a lot are is that the defendant will be ordered to do batter's intervention classes um, and undergo an evaluation if it's uh, applicable. The evaluations are uh, mental health evaluations and drug and alcohol evaluations. Um, so oftentimes we see um, we always we always see the batter's intervention classes if they um, you know qualify for that. Um, and then mental health and drug and alcohol is sometimes ordered as well. Um, as we know, mental health and drug and alcohol do not cause abuse, but they do exacerbate it. So um, all of those um, classes and evaluations are meant to help the defendant. Um, the defendant can also waive their right to a preliminary hearing. Um, this basically means that they bypass that step of the preliminary hearing and decide to proceed to the next step, which is criminal court, um, criminal trials. Um, another possible outcome of a preliminary hearing is um, there can be a hearing in front of the judge. And at that point, the judge will decide essentially what to do with the case. Uh, they can decide to hold some or all of the charges. Um, they can find the, guilt, the defendant guilty of a summary charge or a summary harassment, or the judge can dismiss all the charges. Now uh, with the pandemic, like I said, we are um, adjusting to many changes with the court system. Um, currently we are doing modified in-person proceedings. So we are back in, um, at back at preliminary hearings, the domestic violence preliminary hearings. Um, they are modified, so what the court is doing, and if you have interpreted in Pittsburgh Municipal Court, I'm sure you're familiar with this, um, but they are staggering times. I think it's every 15 minutes they'll put um, either one case or a few cases, just so that there's less people in the building at one time. Um, they also have restrictions on occupancy and uh, everyone is required to wear a mask. Um, there's also remote pr proceedings and those are being held um, on Microsoft Teams. So we've had a few cases where the interpreter is present on Teams, but then we've also had a few cases where there's in-person interpreters. Um, the role of the advocate with the remote proceedings um, is essentially to kind of offer silent accompaniment. Um, so our cameras are off, our sound is off. Um, we are there, uh, but we will follow up with the victim and offer any support afterwards. Um, we also, we're kind of like a facilitator between the client and the uh, assistant district attorney for them to participate remotely. We found that Clients are participating remotely for a variety of reasons. Um, some of them have childcare issues. Some of them reside out of state. Some of them have been exposed to COVID. Um, so we are seeing remote proceedings increase at this time um, and the role of interpreters as well. We've seen um, their participation in remote hearings increase as well. Um, things are constantly changing with the court system. Thankfully, we have a good relationship with court administration and interpreters. So this helps to maintain some level of normalcy, um, which is helpful to all parties involved. Um, so we are very grateful for that partnership. So I'm going to talk about the criminal courts um, before and during the pandemic. So before the pandemic, when an interpreter arrives to court, um, you have to uh, try your best to let the court staff know that you are there and try to communicate with the assistant district attorney on the case and to let them know that you are available. And then you are going to meet with the advocates and the clients. Um, the, also the assist, assistant district attorney uh, we'll ask to uh, speak to the client uh, through the interpreter as well. Um, just to be mindful that um, during the whole process, uh, waiting in the criminal courtroom, it can be a little bit like 
it's really busy up there and everyone's running around, especially for the attorneys. And the ADAs have pounds of cases on their hands. They are running between courtrooms. Um, they check in with clients. Um, so just make sure that you are available to them. That would be super helpful. And make sure that, um, you know, if, if there are family members accompany the clients to be there just to friendly remind them that um, the interpreter, the court interpreter is there and uh, try to ask uh, all the parties to use the court interpreter instead of family members to help the communication. The specialty legal advocate's role during the, um, the time with the clients at the criminal court is to provide the um, support, uh, emotional support, and uh, do some safety planning with the clients. And um, if we see there's a need, we will facilitate an advocate uh, with the assistant district attorney and to communicate what is the best interest of the clients and see if the ADA can make any efforts to make that happen. And also we have to explain the possible outcomes uh, we don't want to surprise the clients, right? So we want to explain the possible outcomes, uh, the possible postponement and a plea agreement or a non-jury trial or a jury trial and uh, what will happen, what to expect for those out outcomes as well. And we always do follow up calls. We follow up with our clients after the court hearings. So during the pandemic, um, the court changed a lot, that the proceeding changed a lot. And um, so far, um, a lot of cases got postponed. And, um, you know, in the hope that we will get better and we can come back in person to proceed the hearing in person. Um, a lot of uh, cases are conducted remotely, which means, uh, as Natalia mentioned, we, the court use Microsoft Teams and they ask um, the participants to uh, join the meeting uh, using the Microsoft Teams to participate. And as Natalia mentioned earlier, uh, as a legal advocate, we are just being there like offer silent support. We know what's going on. We can see um, the people and the court staff in the courtroom, um, but we don't want to really interrupt the proceeding. But we will always follow up with our clients um, to, to, um, to follow up with them and see if there's any needs and questions that we can uh, help with. And also during the pandemic, um, you know, yeah, everything is remotely right now, but uh, what happens if the clients need, like they need help with the internet, with all those technology support our Women's Center and Shelter is able to offer those support to our clients who really in need, uh, for example, for safety reason or um, all kinds of reasons. Uh, our clients need to come into our shelter, uh, have a like a quiet room to do a uh, remote hearing. Uh, we can offer that. And if our clients don't have a computer, or don't have easy access to the internet, we can offer that as well. Uh, we will offer laptops to um, the clients to use during the hearing. And we will try our best to collect all those resources and offer those resources to our clients. Um, so if we see there's a need, we will talk about it and we will try our best to offer to our clients. Okay, um, so we are running kind of short on time and I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So I'll just go quickly through this slide. Um, basically, and I'm sure all of you are aware of the importance of communication between the advocates and, and the interpreters um, for both of our jobs and for the benefit of the client. Um, from a strictly advocate perspective and really just my perspective, um, I think it could be 
very helpful um, if the interpreter informs us if there are any cultural or linguistic differences that are providing or that are impeding communication, um, if appropriate in this in a certain setting. Um, so I have had an interpreter uh, kind of pull me aside, explain to me the cultural difference that was providing a barrier for communication. Um, obviously also informing the client that they were um, letting me know about this barrier. Um, and vice versa, it's important for advocates to have open communication with the interpreters. Um, we try to brief interpreters beforehand on the contents of the meeting or the contents of what we will be talking about with them. Um, but we are always you know, open to feedback. If there's anything that us as advocates can do to um, improve communication between all parties, we are receptive to that as well. Um, so we are here for the exercise. Um, so we are going to have like two slides or uh, the of the terminology that um, we are going to ask you to as an interpreter to try to translate those words. And during the time where you are translating, try to pay more attention to which words might be more difficult to interpret. And we um, appreciate and welcome you to share your um, thoughts with us in this um, session and uh, feel free to reach out to us if we cannot address any uh, or if we missed anything after the session, feel free to reach out to us as well. Uh, Natalia, do you want to talk about the exercise? Um, well, we have these um, words on here. We find these um, to be kind of like the most common, term common terminology that we see both in family court and criminal court. Um, and if you attended our training last year, some of the words on this list may look familiar. Um, and some of these words are um, may be difficult to translate into the target language. Uh, so we want to kind of put these out there to um, let interpreters know that these are the most common words and phrases that we see. Um, and if you want to, I, we can send this out as well, but if you want to, you know, take down any notes or any um, of these phrases, feel free. Um, but we kind of wanted to you know, pose, I guess, pose a question to you, all of the interpreters to see if there's any um, terminology or phrases that are more difficult. Um, and if there's any that are um, not as easily translated into other languages, uh, how you work around that or how do you adapt in order for the client to better understand the message? Yeah, if you could write it down and uh, if you can share with us in the chat, um, welcome, please do that. And so that we know your thoughts and we can open for discussion after that. There are two slides though. This is the first slide. I will give a couple minutes and I will um, scroll down to the next slide. Someone shared indirect criminal contempt, which, yep, two people. That's definitely something um, that's difficult, at least for me to translate into Spanish. I'm obviously not an interpreter, but I do speak Spanish and the concept of that um, is difficult to convey with, with just those words. You have to kind of explain um, the concept in more detail. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, victim impact statement. Yep, 
restitution, DIP. The victim impact statement usually happen uh, during the court, uh, criminal court hearings. At the end, the judge usually always want to like offer the opportunity to the plaintiff, uh, I'm not plaintiff, I'm sorry, uh, to the victim on the case um, to let the judge know um, how did the incident and happen and how did it affect the victim and and the victim's life um, before the judge making any decision or sent, make the sentencing. We can go into the next slide and then if people have questions, they can post them in the chat as well. Okay. There's some more words on here that we see a lot. Um, these are probably the most common charges that we see at the um, preliminary hearing level and criminal trials. Um, we put idioms on here because obviously idioms are very difficult to translate or interpret um, and we do see we do hear quite a bit of idioms in court <laughs> and then some miscellaneous terms as well Conciliation and contempt of court, yeah. Recklessly endangering another person, yes. And again, feel free to jot these down. Um, I think we're going to um, start wrapping up, but please, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or um, there is also a hand raising feature. Um, so if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we can take you off mute if you prefer to um, ask your question instead of typing it out. And this is not an exhaustive list. Um, there's definitely charges on here that we see that are not listed on here, um, but this is kind of like the most common that we see. Yes, we will we will send out the um, PowerPoint. Um, if if you prefer us to uh, send out the PowerPoint and email the PowerPoint to you, um, you can follow up with us. Um, that's what I do think. That works. Uh, you guys have a question. It says, are the PFA paperwork or the attorney application referral translated in other languages? I don't believe so. Yeah, unfortunately they're not. Um, I think this is something that the court administration office has been talking about. Um, but as of now, they are not translated into other languages. Yeah, that's why we think it will be good to share with you as interpreter to just 
get an idea how it looks like and uh, what are those questions about um, to get familiar with it. How long does a PFA intake take? That is a great question. Um, I would say with an interpreter, anywhere from 45 minutes upwards. I did one on Tuesday that took me two and a half hours with an interpreter. So I would say it depends. Um, it depends on whether custody needs to be addressed. It depends on the complexity of the narrative. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, unfortunately it's, it's not a short process to fill out the um, forms especially with the interpreter because it takes like double, kind of like double the time. Um, what we try to do is um, be sometimes if we know there's a real team client who need interpreter um, is going to file the next morning and we will try to do like the intakes uh, the day before so that the uh, clients they don't need to wait physically waiting at uh, family court for the whole morning um, because we already had the application done the day before um, so that's something that we are trying to do to help the clients reduce the time uh, waiting in the family court you guys have another question it says do you always have to do you always use an interpreter or are you able to speak in your native language with clients? Do you want to start saying? Um, so yes and no. So if, first of all, it, like I speak Mandarin and English and Natalia speaks Spanish and English. So if we have a real team clients who speaks the same language, that we do, and um, in like as a follow up call, like a conversation between legal advocate and the client, then we will use our own language. We will talk and speak with um, in our own language. Um, first, uh, that first it will save the time, and second, it really means a lot to the clients because we kind of like can, can, can connect with each other with the language and the culture that we share in common with. Um, but if it's something uh, for the court, for anything the, for the hearings, we definitely will request a uh, interpreter through the court uh, and we will step like behind and let the interpreter do the job. And we will help, um, but we will kind of like um, sit in the back and uh, let the interpreter do their job and to help communication between the uh, the clients and the um, attorneys or the judge. Yeah, I would say for the PFA intake, I think Singh and I can both do it in our native languages, but like Singh said, when it comes to the hearing, we rely on court administration and the court interpreters. Well, it doesn't look like there are any questions and it is 401. We want to respect everyone's time. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we did want to add that we have three more presentations in the next three weeks. Um, the next one is ethics, do's and don'ts. And uh, Mary Jane from Global Wordsmiths will be presenting. Um, it's next Wednesday from three to four. So if you're able to join us, please do so. If you're not able to, it will be recorded as well. Um, so thank you everyone for your time and have a great day. Also, yeah, before you guys hop out, um, we do have a survey. Like I said, I did share it in the chat and it will also be sent out in an email. Um, you can just click the link and take the survey. It's pretty short. Um, it will literally take you less than five minutes, but the feedback would be very helpful for us. Thanks, guys. Thank you.